Good afternoon, I'm Jody Prescott. I'm a lecturer at the University of Vermont. It is my honor to be the moderator for this panel on the Japan Self-Defense Forces <coughs> and Gender. Uh, very delighted to have with us today Consul Aiko Inoue from the Consulate General of Japan in Boston. Consul, if you would please stand up back there. Thank you very much for attending this Thank you, ma'am. Two conferences ago, Dr. Aiko Iwata, Dr. Becca Pincus, and myself were delighted to be able to present our research on the operationalization of gender in the JSDF and talk about the new Japanese National Action Plan as it was being formulated. We chose this woodblock print of an American sailor to introduce ourselves for a couple of reasons. First, it seemed completely appropriate given the fact that Newport was Commodore Perry's hometown and we were here at the Naval War College. Second, it served for us as a reminder, working as a multidisciplinary transnational team on research for an article, that initial impressions with different cultures meet and then meet again, ripple throughout their relationship. And it's important that we properly understand each other as we go forward. Our panel today includes Professor Sabina Fruster, Colonel Amanda Fielding, and Commander Yoko Kawashima. Let me introduce each of them up front. Dr. Fruster is a professor of modern Japanese cultural studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. For Aiko, Becca, and I, when we were doing our research, her research and writing was tremendously important because there is relatively little available in English on gender and Japanese self-defense forces. And her work served as a center point for us around which we could develop a shared understanding of our different perspectives. Dr. Fruschnook is a busy lady, having served as the director of East Asia Center at Santa Barbara and serving on the American Advisory Committee for Japanese Studies of the Japan Foundation and the Northeast Asian Council of the Association of Asian Studies, among other organizations in addition to her teaching. Further, Dr. Fruschnick is a prolific writer, and her most recent book, Playing War, Children and the Paradoxes of Modern Militarism in Japan, just came out this year. As a result of our research, Aiko, Becca, and I concluded that if Japan were to look at the experiences of a Western military, that might have the most translatable lessons learned as the JSDF sought to operationalize gender, it would be Australia. Colonel Amanda Fielding is currently serving as the Gender Advisor to the Australian Defense Forces Chief of Joint Operations. She has a wide range of operational experiences, having served in East Timor, Iraq, and Afghanistan twice, her second time as the Gender Advisor for the Resolute Support Mission. To document that, we have a group photo of Colonel Fielding and her colleagues uh, in front of the descriptively named Yellow Building, the Resolute <laughs> Support Headquarters in Kabul. In her other assignments, Colonel Fielding has served as the commander of the Army School of Ordnance and the deputy head of corps for the Royal Australian Army Ordnance Corps. The final member of our panel is Commander Doko Kawashima who is currently serving in her new assignment as the Japanese Gender Advisor to NATO Headquarters in Brussels. Brussels, excuse me. Commander Kawashima has been with the Maritime Self-Defense Force since 1998, and she has had extensive experience in the fleet. She served as a navigations officer, an operations officer, an executive officer, and most recently as the commanding officer of the JS Setoyuki, a Hatsuyuki-class destroyer currently serving as a training vessel. She also has significant staff experience in her time ashore, including working in the Staff, Plans, and Policy Division of the Maritime Staff Office. It was only with the greatest reluctance that Commander Kawashima allowed me to use this photo of her commanding the Setayuki, but it was simply too cool not to use. <laughs> Please join me in giving a warm welcome for our panelists. Good afternoon. Um, I've been thinking about how I fit into um, the program and um, was thinking about the various categories of uh, military who are here and the various uh, goals of different speakers and organizations. And I thought if, if there is, um, 
you know, organizational improvements or social change, uh, the, if, if those are the goals of uh, some of us, then perhaps um, my expertise in ethnography and history of Japan comes closest to the quest to perhaps re-articulate our questions or question our categories. Um, and so we'd like to take this particular uh, agenda into my paper today. Um, a, a brief uh, note on the self-defense forces. Uh, the self-defense forces were founded in 1954. Uh, in spite of the Constitution's Article 9 that reads, um, and you have it here, uh, I uh, read this out loud, aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat of use of force as a means of settling international disputes. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other uh, war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. Um, as you can imagine, uh, the self-defense forces' exact role and reach have been debated ever since. Moreover, the integration of women has never been uh, before been articulated quite as forcefully as under the current administration of Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. All signs point to this particular moment being a decisive one for both the direction of Japan's self-defense forces and the role of women among their ranks. Um, so one of the uh, premises uh, for, for my discussion in particular is that the self-defense forces operate in a very spe uh, specific uh, legal space that uh, makes many of its members wonder what exactly uh, their competence, what exactly their goals, what exactly the restrictions on their various uh, activities on a uh, range of missions are. Um, a second point I would like to make is that the women who join the self-defense forces uh, volunteer from within a society that, uh, whose gender inequality compares to few others in the global north. And so just to juxtapose three different kinds of uh, data here, um, the Human Development Index, uh, for instance, tells us that Japan is one of the highest levels of socioeconomic equality. The, peace, uh, the Global Peace Index ranks Japan as one of the world's most peaceful countries with regards to such indicators as social unrest, crime, and armed conflict. But when it comes to gender inequality, Japan strongly resembles most of Latin America, Vietnam, or China, all countries with dramatically lower levels of human development. Now, when you think about this, of course, one question we need to ask is why uh, the women who join the self-defense forces uh, are motivated to join uh, the military in the first place. Um, and I think uh, um, um, Ms. Kabashima, Kabashima will go into more detail in terms of data, but I just want to mention that it was in the mid-1990s when the self-defense forces first initiated uh, a campaign to recruit more women. Um, they got very quickly to something between 5 and 6%. Um, and they're currently at something like 7.6%. So we're talking about almost 30 years of some kind of effort of gender integration that has been, and I think that's fair to say, largely unsuccessful. So the, that, that um, actually uh, very much contradicts the very motivation, the very key motivations uh, that um, uh, young women have to join the self-defense forces because one of their key motivations is to find in the self-defense forces a merit-based career system that they believe, uh, and, and uh, to a large degree justifiably so, lacks in civil society. So they go into the military in the belief that the military is the one organization in society that actually does um, um, uh, advance people according to a very uh, objective and uh, transparent uh, uh, measures of achievement. Um, there's a number of other motivators. One is, um, and this is of course tied to this first uh, motivation, one is social mobility. Uh, when we talk about enlisted and uh, enlisted service members and to a large degree also non-commissioned officers, 
Um, they imagined that joining the military would get them uh, socially uh, mobile and, and move them up uh, compared to whatever kinds of professions they might uh, embody in civilian life. Um, for others, uh, joining the self-defense forces is a vehicle for pursuing a career elsewhere. And uh, on the officer's level, of course, these uh, motivations and the very um, hierarchy among them um, changes a little bit across different kinds of career paths, but um, officers too, to some degree, um, see, or some of them see uh, joining the self-defense forces as something like plan B to a diplomatic career if they belong and come from uh, a socioeconomic background that does not allow them to attend a university, a, a, very good, a good university and allow them a good education uh, based on their own uh, needs. So, um, recent defense-wide papers do report uh, significant advances for female uniformed self-defense force uh, personnel, but as I mentioned, the numbers uh, uh, show a rather um, depressed picture, I, I suppose is one way to put it. Um, the, um, uh, to facilitate uh, further change, uh, the self-defense force uh, must create an effective gender policy that is based on a complete understanding of the obstacles to integrating women. Um, to do that, and I think that ties back to some of what uh, Professor Brooks said this morning in terms of um, as long as this conversation is a conversation that takes place among women only, uh, we're not making much, or, or primarily women, we're not making much progress. And so along those same lines, I'd suggest here that um, when we think gender integration, when we think women integ women's integration, perhaps in any organization, but particularly in the military, we need to take into account what kinds of men and masculinities are at work uh, within that organization, within the military. Um, and so with, um, with the self-defense forces, I've done interviews with about 200 um, service members, a lot of, the, actually many more women than is justified, uh, but uh, a lot of men as well. Um, and so what I found is that many of them see as the, um, the models to which they have an ambivalent uh, relationship. So they're both attracting characteristics as well as characteristics that make them distance themselves and identify themselves as distinct from those. Um, are three types of masculinities. Um, and so I, I think this is important to understand precisely because uh, within the self-defense forces, sort of the combat mission or the combat uh, soldier is not uh, the, the key uh, uh, individual, is not the, the vision that, soldier, that young men and women have when they join the military. Um, one of those three types um, is uh, one of these three types uh, is the salary man or the white collar worker. And so a lot of uh, uh, young men who join the self defense forces think primarily in terms of that's what they not they don't want to be. That's what their work, what they uh, aspire to, what they think the self defense forces is about, what they imagine their roles will be about is not that white collar worker. It's not somebody who is selfishly pursuing his own goals or the goals of the company that are primarily economic. What they do imagine uh, is very much in contrast to that, a role that does good. And so I, um, I this is uh, sort of out of in order. This is the kind of image that a lot of young men have. They're thinking about doing good in the context of uh, community, uh, a service in the context of um, disaster relief, both domestically and internationally, and in similar kinds of roles. Um, and so they see the mainstream sort of hegemonic uh, masculinity of the salaryman as uh, a contrasting type of masculinity. Another um, figure, such figure that, uh, that um, plays into um, how um, men within the self-defense forces identify as members of the military uh, is a historical figure, namely uh, members of the Imperial Army and uh, Navy. 
And this is, again, it's not something that is embraced. It's not like uh, when you think about it, I know I'm caricaturing now uh, other militaries, but it's not like in some other militaries, particularly uh, the American, that looks back on great heroes of past, past wars. That's not a possibility for uh, Japanese uh, soldiers. And um, so, but, but the Imperial Army, Sol uh, Imperial Army soldier is still sort of a figure that plays into their uh, uh, self-identity in terms of uh, we want to be different and we want to show that we are different from uh, the Imperial Army for a number of reasons. Partly, and uh, something that is often forgotten in such uh, narratives, partly because they lost the war, partly also because there is an understanding of the army in particular, the Imperial Army in particular, uh, of having uh, uh, committed war crimes, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's not, there's no positive uh, relationship possible with, with the past military. But that said, um, particularly the now older generation of self-defense forces members have grandfathers who have some sort of either uh, were at the end of the war or even served in the, in the Second World War. And so there's some kind of lineage, some kind of necessity of these young men to clarify their relationship to uh, the predecessor of the self-defense forces. And then third, um, also something that is not unique to Japan, but, but specific and of importance when we think about what kinds of masculinities are venerated within the self-defense force what kind of integration uh, within what kind of uh, uh, um, male and masculinist environment we're talking about um, is the um, American soldier. And again, I'm caricaturing, of course, I'm aware of different branches and different modes and all, all of that, but from the perspective of a Japanese member of the self-defense forces, there's an American soldier out there either physically because uh, there are thousands of troops stationed in Japan or because of the American soldiers or some version of it, uh, his presence in popular culture, in American popular culture that of course is consumed in Japan as well. There's no Japanese popular culture to speak of that is the equivalent of Hollywood that turns out less so in the last couple of years, but turns out movie after movie about uh, what the American military does uh, in various places. Now, the anxiety about how to, uh, in any case, in this fluid context, one gender configuration of, uh, is not more real or pretentious or more hidden or overt than another, but what I'm suggesting is that each service member needs to sort of figure out where he stands in that particular uh, environment. Um, and so it is, um, uh, uh, the, um, well, let me go to the next. Uh, so in any case, the anxiety about how to properly produce and perform militarized masculinity then is by no means uh, unique to the self-defense forces. As the types of valorized soldierhood across military establishments around the world multiply, armed forces in democratic countries uh, the world over, as you all know, have been lowering the admission barriers regarding gender and orientation particularly women and homosexuals, uh, homosexuals uh, in addition, in an effort to maintain their legitimacy in a post-Cold War world, these armed forces have also become increasingly inventive about making ever more missions military ones. And so in uh, Dr. Brooks' uh, most recent books, uh, book um, uh, that um, uh, the, the Tales from the uh, Pentagon, she makes this um, argument about um, the reflexive, and she's talking about America of course, uh, the reflexive preference for military solutions to civilian problems. Um, that's, that's a general trend, but I think we need to understand that that's the only kind of mission uh, that the self or the a version of that is the only kind of mission the self-defense forces have engaged in thus far. Um, and so it's no surprise then that um, the kinds of um, motivations, the kinds of ideals that self-defense uh, uh, self forces members uh, adhere to and that they uh, are exposed to in public relations material very much has to do with the self-defense force as an organization that helps and that um, 
goes in after a disaster, for instance, and does the kind of work that no other organization, uh, at the moment at least, is able uh, to perform. And so it's no surprise then that you have uh, images like these and the kinds of messages like these that are circulating both out of the public relations apparatus of the self-defense forces and that are then also re-narrated uh, by uh, 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 service members, particularly the younger generation, particularly the generation post-2011, uh, the triple disaster in northeastern Japan, that this is the kind of vision uh, they have when going into the self-defense forces. It's about making peace uh, your own, uh, taking care, um, um, and, and then also these are messages and ideas that are very individualized in recent years because despite all the rhetoric about Japan being um, a, a collectivist society, uh, the younger generation is just as invested in their own individu individuality and subjectivity as um, young people elsewhere. All of these then uh, complicates the self-understanding of self-defense force me service members, their status within Japanese society, and ironically, the role of women. And so my expectation uh, at the very onset or outset of my research was, well, if this is a military that engages exclusively in missions that are uh, 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 missions other than war, then shouldn't it be so much easier to integrate uh, women among their ranks. And for lots of reasons, I'm sure um, my colleagues here will enlighten us today as well, uh, this has not been uh, the case. Add to that the fact that the decreasing birth rate, uh, which was already low, greatly impacts the recruitment pool today. The SDF have endured for decades a recruitment shortage of men that only worsened when Prime Minister Abe in July 2014 claimed Japan's right of collective self-defense uh, this is an important legal change that, uh, by all accounts, will allow Japan to uh, participate in war. Uh, it's not clear under what circumstances and what context and on whose side, and well, I guess on whose side is pretty clear. Um, <laughs> Japan's slow fertility rate, which is widely believed to be the result of young women's resistance to traditional life paths uh, that largely exclude them from serious careers, will only further reduce the number of young men eligible uh, for military service. And Japan's largely anti-immigration and naturalization laws only exacerbate its difficulty in, affecting, uh, in attracting and maintaining military forces at the level it considers appropriate. That's it. Thank you. As has been mentioned a number of times, Today. This is an evolving agenda, the Women, Peace and Security agenda, and the practical application of this agenda is certainly progressing over time and we are testing and adjusting as we go. Um, the ADF has had a national action plan and a defence <coughs> implementation plan since 2012, uh, and it was in 2015 that we were approached by the Japanese Self-Defence Force um, to share with them our experiences in implementing uh, women, peace and security on operations um, and to share with them our, our lessons learnt from that. And you'll notice that I put up there one of those lessons, which is something that was raised very early in the day, was we talk about uh, WPS in an operational context. We call it integrating a gender perspective in military operations. And that's really important to note because when we were first introducing this into operational planning, um, the planners did balk at the term women um, because they were saying to us, well, why would we only consider, 50, and it, you'll all laugh at this, 50% of the population when we're doing our operational planning. Um, so we used the term gender and emphasised the fact that we're talking about women, men, girls and boys, but nine times out of ten it still served the women, peace and security gender because we still discovered when we did our gender analysis, when we did our planning, that women were disproportionate victims of conflict um, and that nine times out of ten when we did our key leader engagement, when we identified the key influences in our areas of operation, that we did not identify the key women that were there and we weren't getting the whole picture of the operating environment that we were working in. So we explained to the planners that the roles of men, women, girls and boys impacts on our operating environment and it's also important for us to understand when we deploy somewhere 
the impact that our mission can also have on men, women, girls and boys and their roles in that society. So we conducted three workshops with the Japanese Self-Defence Force. Uh, one was in October 15, which was focused very much on training and how the ADF was going to introduce gender into training. Um, in February 16, uh, we had a seminar talking about best practice uh, and application on operations. In particular, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, as was just mentioned, um, and peacekeeping operations. And then in July last year, we had a workshop uh, of which the Japanese Self-Defence Force really wanted us to speak to them about the role of gender advisors on humanitarian assistance disaster relief missions. Uh, they wanted us to talk about the military guidelines for the protection of civilians and how we were applying that in the gender space um, and how we were including women, peace and security and gender into our bilateral and multilateral exercises. So that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this presentation, is those synergies and, and the consequences of those discussions. Oop. I try to avoid builds. One of the first things we had to identify is where does gender fit in the operating environment? And this is really important for operational planners to, to understand. It without a doubt fits in the human space, in the, in the human domain. And we're talking about the moral and ethical component of um, operations and, and deployments. But it equally fits in the maritime space, uh, of which I know that Junko will, will speak about. Um, and it probably has its greatest synergy with land operations, where we as militaries are working with and amongst the, the populations. Um, but it equally has relevance in air, um, in particular when we conduct our targeting boards. It's really important that we understand the patterns of movement and the roles of every member of a population um, to ensure that we do cause no further harm in the conduct of our operations. Um, also, considering a gender perspective is highly relevant when we're setting up bases, uh, when we're conducting port visits, um, when we're supporting any kind of operation overseas. So one of the things that we have learnt, and um, certainly I read this in Professor Fustuk's um, paper, is that the participation of women in military operations is driven by the needs of the military and not gender equality. So while it's just not about equity, it's not just about doing the right thing, because it is the right thing to do, but it is also about capability. And it was uh, our Australian Chief of Army, Lieutenant General Angus Campbell, who stated an article in March um, where he was focusing on um, comments on women, peace and security. He said, it is a practical disadvantage to have an all-male combat force. It's crucial to put the most effective force into the field. In a culture where it is routinely forbidden for women to have interaction with males, not of their family, having women involved in your operations has a very powerful effect. I've put those two pictures up um, on the, the slide. Um, I'll start with Afghanistan. We've spoken about Afghanistan. It was talked about in our opening remarks today. In a patriarchal society like Afghanistan, um, it is really important when our mission is to integrate the women within the security forces there, um, that we understand what the cultural imperatives are. Um, one of the key things is that our adversaries our enemy take advantage of our gender biases. And this is something that was certainly been taken advantage of in Afghanistan. They took advantage of the fact that we didn't have women in the security forces manning checkpoints. They took advantage of the fact that when the special for Afghan special forces were conducting raids, they would hide uh, weapons, they would hide ammunition, they would hide plans amongst the women and children because they knew that they wouldn't be searched. So it was an operational imperative to actually train women in the special police forces. And when they conduct their raids, they have um, at least two women uh, go with them on those raids. And those women are fully trained uh, in those roles. And they've discovered that it provided them with an operational, um, enhanced operational effect and a tactical advantage. The other picture that you'll see is an operation which I know the US also participates in as does Canada, which is called Operation Render Safe. And Operation Render Safe is an annual um, activity where they go to South Pacific nations to dispose of remnants of war, um, particularly from, from World War II. And a lot of these remnants of war are actually encountered by children. And often these children, um, so a lot of the education that occurs on this activity is done with um, families. 
And so when we sent the gender advisors for the first time, um, it took a bit of effort and the commander of the Australian contingent said to me, well, why do I need to take a gender advisor? We've got community engagement teams, why do we need this? When he came back from that activity, he said, when I go next time, I'm going to put it in my post-operational report, I want more than one, because it was too much work for the one advisor to go meet with the women in the communities um, to, because it was better off educating them because they knew it was the better way to get through to the children as well. So um, just a key demonstration how a gender advisor or utilising women that were part of the contingent um, for that effort enhanced our operational effect. Uh, one of the key things that the Japanese Self-Defence Force wanted to speak to the ADF about is the first time we deployed a gender advisor on an Australian Defence Force mission was for what we called Operation Fiji Assist, which was the um, HADR operation that we conducted after Tropical Cyclone Winston in Fiji. And I don't know how much people here know about Fiji. Fiji has quite a high level of sexual gender-based violence uh, amongst the population. Um, we learnt many lessons um, from this operation, which I could do an entire speech on on its own, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to highlight with you. And one of them was that we discovered that the conditions in the aftermath of a natural disaster often reflect those of conflict zone, including the fact that it impacts on the local security forces and law enforcement, and therefore in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, there is a lack of law enforcement. And what was reported back to us by the Fijians is that they saw a rapid um, increase in the amount of violence against the population in the immediate aftermath uh, of that disaster. They also at first didn't recognise that at the evacuation holding centres where there was predominantly families, they didn't have any female security forces. And it also provided an, an opportunity for those um, who wanted to take advantage of that situation to, to abuse, abuse those women in particular. So it helped them think uh, about different ways of looking at security and how it actually applied to something like disaster relief. But of course, one of the other many lessons was with, after meeting with the women, um, we adjusted and we spoke to um, our DFAT colleagues about what PACs, humanitarian PACs, they were providing the population. So we've got a better understanding of what their actual needs are. And of course, we talked about peacekeeping operations, and I mean, since that's where the agenda arose from, I don't think I need to cover that in any detail after your brief this morning. I wanted to show you this slide because one of the other key lessons that we learnt in introducing 1325 and women, peace and security into our operational planning was because we were focusing on gender, the planners started saying, asking us about all kinds of other areas relating to the population that we're expected to know. So while 1325 has eight related resolutions, I would suggest there's several other resolutions that apply as well. And I've listed them there on the screen. And I think we need to be familiar with children and conflict and, and those related resolutions to 1612. Protection of civilians, obviously conflict related and sexual gender based violence and rape and sexual violence being used as a weapon of war. Um, the gender architecture in, in counter terrorism, and this is something we are certainly focusing on um, with our operations uh, in Iraq as part of the coalition at the moment, is that what is the role that women and girls and children play in violent extremism and terrorism? One, they're being used as human shields and as victims and as sex slaves um, and to help raise money for the caliphate, but at the same time, once again, our adversaries are taking advantage of our gender biases and are utilising women as informants, etc. Uh, sexual exploitation and abuse we've also talked about and is something that's incredibly important for us to train our, our troops on. Um, and human trafficking often comes up as well, particularly within the Pacific where um, a lot of maritime patrols um, encounter all kinds of, of trafficking, including um, in people. So, in the implementation and the mainstreaming of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, um, and while we have an operational imperative and we have national direction and policy on integrating a gender perspective, we have discovered that at the end of the day, the centre of gravity, using a very military term, for the operationalisation of gender is heavily reliant on gender advisors. So while it is 
the responsibility of everyone in the Australian Defence Force to apply a gender perspective, they are heavily reliant on us for our expertise at the moment. And this is why we're trying desperately to grow our gender advisor capability because they're not just providing advice to the commanders and staff on the headquarters, they're actually doing the inputs to the planning. They're conducting the engagement in, in the field with the key agencies to deconflict and coordinate our, our efforts to support uh, women and girls. So finally, I'd just like to talk about education and training. So there was a real need for us to um, train as many gender advisors as we possibly could. And so we ran our first gender advisor course in early June this year, uh, prior to Exercise Talisman Sabre, which is our major bilateral exercise with the, the US forces, supporting 30, 35,000 um, troops. Um, so training those gender advisors has already demonstrated an operational effect for us. Training those gender advisors, um, they, they left and they've produced um, new conflict-related sexual gender-based violence reporting systems. Um, I had one of our Air Force gender advisors talk to me about how she attended a targeting board. And not only did they talk about collateral damage, but she explained to all those, um, all those planners that were in that room, all the operators, about what a collateral effect is and how that can have a longer term effect on the population and the way it operates. And so we've seen some great benefits just from training those few specialists. We've also built it into our professional military and education training. So from the, the private soldier, um, sailor, airman, airwoman level, right up to um, the officer rank of major. So we do need to focus, and Beth Leif and I spoke about this earlier, we really do need to focus on our leadership because while I see it being very well mainstreamed from the rank of colonel down, uh, because everyone in the ADF gets trained on this, uh, what we have learnt is that we do need to educate our leaders, which is something else that we certainly passed on to the Japanese Self-Defence Force in, in that workshop um, where we were talking about these issues. And then finally, collective training is incredibly important. Um, conduct, conducting exercises to reflect how we do business on, on operations. And we make sure that it is applied to all types of operations, but certainly we've seen the greatest synergy at the moment in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Um, and in peacekeeping operations, but equally in high-end warfighting, it is during those kind of, in, those con in the height of conflict, is where the um, disadvantaged in the population actually get, get targeted. And we often ignore that when, when we're in the heat of battle, um, when the population is really suffering. So this is something that we're trying to get our forces to focus on. And I'll finish where I started, which is to grow the capability to increase our interoperability, um, we need to work together. So as this agenda evolves, we really need to, conferences like this are perfect, where we can share ideas on the best way to take this agenda forward. So thank you very much for listening. And um, I've really enjoyed what I've learned so far, so thank you. Thank you, Colonel Fielding. Commander Washington. First of all, on behalf of the Ministry of Defense of Japan, I really appreciate having participated in this conference. Now I'm working for the Women Peace Security Office in NATO headquarters, but today I will talk as a member of Japan Maritime Self Defense Force. Uh, Japan Self Defense Force started employment of women in the ground self defense force in the latter half of 1960. Since then, in 14 years, uh, 40 years, the number of women in the SDF increased. Uh, currently, about 14,000 women, 6.1 percent. In response to the current environment of Japan, the Ministry of Defense indicated a new direction last April to promote more active role of women in SDF. My theme today is the present situation and efforts of the SDF concerning women, peace and security. Uh, uh, the uh, presentation on the screen. 
Uh, as you know, the security environment in the Asia Pacific region is increasingly tense. Nuclear and missile development, risks to global commons, international terrorism, and so on. Such changes of the situation make the mission of the SDF more diversified and complicated. SEA personnel are expected to have more multifaceted abilities and knowledge. In Japan, as has been mentioned, the decreasing birth rate and the rapidly aging are a severe problem. Also, women are getting high education and participate in society actively. SDF has difficulty to get young people and to decrease the rate of midway retirement due to the burden to women like child care or nursing care. Uh, that is manpower problem. Speaking about the inside of SDF, SDF have gradually opened position on the areas for direct combat, uh, areas directly supporting the combat troops and areas with high physical burden since 1993. Two years ago, all of the areas in the Air Self-Defense Force were open to women. SDF set its goal to increase women more than 9% by 2030. When it comes to promotion, the first woman rear admiral was born in the MSDF, American Self-Defense Force, this January. Uh, mentioning about myself, I joined uh, MSDF after graduating uh, university. And last year, I served as a commanding officer of a destroyer type ship. Uh, 20 years ago, some female resources officers said that uh, they need women commanding officers and women pilots, but it should be through the same education, experience, and evaluation as men. So they wanted us to achieve results. Although it took a long time, women can be commanding officers of ship and air corps under the same criteria as uh, men now. Talking about awareness, how to look at uh, working uh, women, this is also my personal opinion. Uh, there is a big difference men in their 40s and men in their 50s in Japan. Men in the 40s don't seem to feel uncomfortable to work with women, and they seem to think that women with abilities can be active regardless of gender, and they are more generous to take paternity leave for their family. One of the reasons is the influence of their parents, whether they saw their mother working outside or not, and the other one is whether the women student exists in the National Defense uh, Academy. Maybe I'm a little bit op optimistic. I expect the concept of WPS in the SDF will change drastically in five to 10 years as the current parties become high rank commanders. On the other hand, about women awareness, it seems that women themselves do not have the satisfaction about present open door situation. What women care now is which office is suitable to manage child rearing and nursing care. In short, they want to continue their work. Women retiree rate decreased from 9% to 1.5% in the past 30 years. But it's still high compared to 0.6% for men. I suppose this may indicate that women are still obliged to make efforts to manage their work-life balance. I believe that there is a key in this point for increasing the promotion of women, uh, reducing career retirement rates, and raising women's motivation and satisfaction. Uh, from now, I'd like to talk about Women Personnel Empowerment Initiative as current efforts of uh, JSDF. The Ministry of Defense thinks it should be flexible and diverse in the wake of the changes of society. From that context, to promote empowerment of women are necessary for securing qualified personnel, 
integrating various perspectives and projecting our core value, equality of both sexes. There are two concepts for the policy. First, indispensable and minimum capabilities as uh, SDF personnel are to keep ready for emergency, physical strength, experience, and skills. To satisfy these elements may not be easy for, to, uh, for the personnel who have children or older parents sometimes. A second, on these elements as foundation, all the personnel should make full use of their own abilities and experiences to maintain the best, best performance of the organization as a whole. Based on this concept, uh, MOD put two policies, achieve equality, I call opportunity, and right person in the right place. Achieve equal opportunity. Men and women can get the same opportunities regardless of sex, sexual orientation. Right person in the right place. Uh, personnel are assigned to the post according to their ability, motivation, without discrimination by sex. It is not guaranteed to locate the women evenly in all occupations because of the differences of physical strength the pro uh, proportion of women may be few in some duties that are physically heavily loaded as a result. Under the two policies, there are three challenges. First one is opening position for women. Virtually all positions in the JSDF are open to women due to labor legislation tunneling units in the uh, ground self-defense force and part of the NBC weapon defense unit. And uh, due to the space limitation, submarines are not open yet. Second one is expansion of the number of women recruitment. The ASDF abolished to set number of women enlisted in the adoption test from 2016. As a result, the number of women who passed the test for officer candidate, aviation student, etc., increased to 223, 32% from 95, 12% in 2015. This initiative announced that the Ground Self Defense Force will increase the rate of enlistment from 770 to 930 and Defense Academy from 40 to 60. The JS, uh, JSDF set the goal to adopt women more than 10% of all the recruits from next fiscal year 2018. The third one is work-life balance. Initiative mentioned that the need for awareness reform above all organization, effective use of flex time, promotion of taking childcare leave, including men career plus support for working couple. In response to the initiative, Ground, Air, Maritime Self Defense Force is developing its education and career management system, infrastructure, especially for child care and the mental system to meet each character. Uh, one of the themes I am interested in about uh, women peace security in the JSDF as a Navy officer is what is gender perspective in maritime security. The Great East Japan earthquake six years ago is still fresh in our mind. I'd like to take this opportunity to express our appreciation uh, to all the countries including the United States and all the organizations and the people who gave Japan great and warm support. Uh, Japan has many natural disasters the SDF has uh, carried out many disaster relief activities so far. I think that there were the consideration for the weak people, including women in such activities, although we did not call them as a kind of gender perspective. The Maritime Self-Defense Force took it into account that women, women with babies, elder women cared about hygiene issues and try to offer bathing and washing efficiently and to provide space to rest with female crews 
and doctors. However, the lessons learned and the result of the MSDF activities were not organized as gender perspective to use it in the future in maritime or joint operation. I think this is a challenge for the JSDF. Uh, there are some maritime operations in which gender perspective is required, such as disaster relief, counter pilots, refugees. The Navy can provide their vessels and personnel and can approach disaster area in early stage, also can conduct long-term mission and can offer wide and clean space. Taking into such uh, the advantage of the Navy, I am trying to make it clear how to put gender perspective into naval operation. I thank you for all your kind attention. Master of Ceremonies, we met our time. Do we have time for a couple questions, perhaps? Uh, three questions. Outstanding. <laughs> Vince. Uh, yeah, so I do a lot of training with the Japanese, mostly young Sakura in December. And one of the events that we started last year was bilateral talks. And it was the Japanese uh, equivalent to our sergeant major uh, for the Southwest Army's uh, forces that brought this up. And he was the one who started it. But it was a talk between the female personnel of the Japanese Army and the U.S. Army. And there are several different topics, but one of them is uh, what you mentioned was the work-life balance. And we're going to try to replicate that again this year, but I was wondering if there's any specific topics you would like to discuss in that as well, other topics besides the work-life balance. Vince, so forgive me, are you asking Commander Kawashima? Uh, yes, her and maybe Sabine as well, if you have any other insights that in my point. I I can I, I don't I don't really have an agenda in this particular context that you're mentioning, but at least from the interviews I did with female service members, uh, the life work balance is key and that's a, a parallel to society at large. It's not specific to the military. In fact, um, many women in the military uh, say that the, the military does a better job than a lot of corporations do in order in, in terms of um, allowing men and women to take medical leave or family leave or whatever. Um, but another topic I've encountered, and, and again, this is ethnographic research, not, not <coughs> large data uh, uh, analysis, um, is that women are often not only prevented from certain roles that allow them to have a career, right, that, that make them pass certain achievement levels in order to advance, um, but they are often also infantilized in the sense that uh, their, their um, superiors don't demand as much of them uh, because they assume that they're not capable of that or that they're that they're only really women, and so one shouldn't be so harsh on them, things like that. So there's a, a multifaceted uh, set of, of conventions that prevent women, not aggressively and not, not uh, in an articulated kind of way, but sort of uh, in a, in a, in a, on a level of conventions and norms from uh, advancing. Answer that could uh, you repeat the your we'll, question we'll, again? We'll do some bilateral talks uh, with just the females in our organizations. So it'll be the, the Northeast Army, and it'll be First Corps and some of the supporting units. And it'll be just the females talking about the issues that they face in the military or being a female in the military. And so I was wondering if there's anything that you saw from your perspective that'd be important to talk about. As you know, the Japanese uh, work from the morning till late. So 
at first uh, the, a lot of women want to go home uh, as soon as possible after work and uh, uh, another one is the duty system uh, yeah, Italy has uh, of course duty but uh, sometimes the women with babies uh, want to skip or the, to um, how do I say uh, uh, exempt sorry uh, exempt uh, such duties and uh, also uh, almost all the women uh, in the SDF uh, has a husband in M uh, SDF also so uh, they have to coordinate the such uh, the duty system uh, uh, or the and also I have mentioned in the uh, presentation uh, Japan ha uh, is a problem about the uh, aging uh, issues so uh, not only the child care but also some uh, females have uh, the challenges to the uh, their parents so um, what I would say is uh, we of course we have the such system uh, but not it's not work well so they just want to not change the system but they want to use uh, effectively the system uh, I think that is a problem for the women Sheila. Uh, Colonel Fields, um, you talked about um, the fact that your training and education is taking place on the Australian Army or, or military uh, dealing with um, gender. Um, how did you convince them to do it? In, in the American Army there's, or the military, there's a lot of pushback, but there's too much training to be done as it is right now. How can we fit one more thing into it? So could you give us your success and how you made it happen? Uh, leadership. So Chief of Defence Force, Chief of Joint Operations are both very strong proponents of uh, women, peace and security and we've built it into existing training. So in our pre-deployment force preparation training, into our joint operations courses, into our staff college um, and in, into our training for, um, like I said, from soldier rank right up to, to the officer level. So, that's how, how we've done it. When it came to the gender advisor course though, it was a, a different story. Um, so CDF, so the Chief of the Defence Force, directed that we needed a course based on the fact that we couldn't meet operational demand. So once we had sent a couple of gender advisors on operations and exercises, and we do send gender advisors on every exercise that we do, we didn't have enough trained asset because we could only get two people um, per sweet in course on, on the course, uh, which is not enough to grow a capability. So um, the Chief of Joint Operations also said, um, look, we really need to get these people trained because it was having an impost on, on me and my Lieutenant Colonel because we were training everyone before they deployed, individually training everyone before they deployed. Um, but because the rest of defence, it's still being mainstreamed at that senior level. When we took it to the Defence Education and Training Board, um, the one stars who were sitting on that board would not support it, even though it had been directed by the Chief. So it, so the Chief of Joint Operations said, well, right, you've got a training background, Amanda. You look into what resources you need. CDF gave us um, some, some funds, some reserve funds. We hired some reservists and we ran our first course in June. Uh, because of the success of the course, the generals have now got their ears pricked up and said, oh, we heard it was really successful, um, I think we might take it on now as part of our education <laughs> training system. Uh, they also saw the great interest that we've had regionally. Um, it's been a really good soft engagement tool with a, a lot of our regional neighbours and we've had some really good engagements, particularly within the Asia Pacific, with other nations to talk about how it can really enhance our operations. So yeah, it was a challenge, but leader, it, it was all about leadership. Thank you. I've neglected this side of the room. Uh, one last question, perhaps? If not, we're done. Thank you, ladies.